Tokyo is not the world's most populous city, even with 12 million inhabitants. More people live in Shanghai, in Mexico City. But nowhere else is the working population packed, processed, delivered and collected with such efficiency. In the Nahano yard of the Maranucci subway line, preparation begins long before its light. Every working day, the smoothly meshed transit network that enfolds the capital carries over six million passengers. From dawn until midnight, streams of gleaming trains speed in and out of the city, over and under the streets. As Tokyo grows even larger, the cost of living in or near the center spirals. Many are being forced out into the neatly arranged suburbs, some 12 million of them, all within commuting distance. In big European cities, a house might cost a well-paid worker the equivalent of three years' salary. In Japan, it takes 12 years' income. <laughs> Shinya Kotani, an unusually fortunate business executive, and his family live in the Yurigaka area, about 30 miles from Tokyo. He bought his home in the early 1960s after marrying, like many, with the help of the company. Few newlyweds could afford anything as spacious today. It's the price of a roof over their heads that makes it virtually impossible for couples to bring up more than two children. As people are forced to live further out, the daily journeys to work have become longer, and breakfast is the one family ritual left to share. I live in the suburbs, and it takes time to commute. So I get up around 7 o'clock in the morning, and I leave home about 8. I either walk or take the bus to the station, and the train takes me directly to the office. I get there around 9.20. The train is very crowded and there is no way I can get a seat. There are some people reading the newspaper or reading books, but I doubt that they can get much reading done. With 250 people jammed into a car designed to carry 100, reading is not an easy matter. Many passengers prefer to keep the experience at ear's length with a portable sound system. Those who do turn to literature usually go in for a unique local variety called manga, adult comic books. Television in the hands, subway veterans call it. The ordeal was bad enough when the average subway journey took one hour. Now it's closer to two hours, the silent majority simply swaying stoically along. The freshly printed advertising sheets fluttering from the ceiling are wasted on them. They just want to get there. Station attendant Nogawa not only works on the subway that brings Mr. Kotani in from the suburbs, his job at Ginza Station means that in order to deal with Tokyo's unique late night and early morning rush hours, he must sleep and eat underground as well. Despite the size of the system and the fact that it carries twice the passengers of the New York subway with only half the number of carriages, this operation employs fewer than 5,000 personnel. Only the dedication of employees like Nagawa makes that possible. I felt the TLTA had a lot of potential as a company. Also, I happen to like working with people, working with customers. That is why I chose this job. The subway runs throughout the city of Tokyo and is used by thousands of people. I believe it is quite vital to the city. Hi means yes, and much more. A readiness to cooperate, willingness to please, is the motivating spirit of the immaculately uniformed men of the Teito Rapid Transit Authority. After a morning pep talk, they're expected to do everything required to run the station, swapping jobs from time to time and organizing themselves into shifts. Since there's virtually no crime on the subway, apart from occasional pickpocketing, there are no police. The station attendant must look after the passenger in every way, all 350,000 of them daily. Get it. Get it. 
Shinjuku station on the Marunouchi line is the busiest stop on the system. Two million passengers a day pour through, the majority in the morning rush hour. Some arriving, most transferring. The passengers are swamped with loudspeaker instructions, even though the matching color of trains, signs and platforms clearly shows them where to go. Japanese tourists have been known to wait in vain on foreign subway platforms for a train which matches their map. The crush is even worse in winter when travelers are wrapped up in heavy clothes. It's then that the station attendants must occasionally play the role of pushers. They not only stuff the last passenger in, but pull the excess ones out. For the flood tide of arriving business suits, the so-called salary men, the routine is only too familiar. Eye contact with their fellow sufferers is avoided. Certainly no conversation. The movements of the platform drill are second nature to them. They move to an inner rhythm of their own. Without prompting, commuters form themselves into serried ranks, separated depending on their destination. They wait patiently, silently, confident in the knowledge that in less than 2.69 minutes, there'll be another train. Everyone will get to work and get there on time. Arriving passengers are always let off first. For those waiting, strictly three abreast of course, they know there's no need to jump the queue or step beyond the line painted on the platform edge. As one line boards, the next in turn moves two paces smartly to the left to take its place. For the uninitiated, the rules are bewildering. But in a society where efficiency and conformity are esteemed virtues, the patience of subway travelers is impressive to even the most experienced of observers. Donald Ritchie is one of them. One of the things which people often speak of here is the presumed homogeneity of the Japanese society, where they are so homogenous that nobody will, will stand out from the crowd, uh, and very often uh, uh, the subway itself is used as a paradigm for this. Uh, a car can maybe hold 100, and it's got 1,000 in it. Uh, these people lose their shoes, their handbags, parts of their skirts or trousers daily. Why don't they put up with it? Why don't they, well, why do they put up with it? Why don't they say that they're angry or something? Well, that's one question. Uh, I think they don't because you, you simply don't do that. This is not that kind of argumentative society. You, you put up with things for as long as you are in a majority which has agreed to put up with them. Mr. Kotani, his two children at school and his wife left at home in the suburbs, is a typical long-distance commuter. 63% of Tokyo citizens over the age of 15 have jobs to go to. It means a total workforce of more than 6 million, most of them white-collar service industry employees. If many approach the output of Mr. Kotani, who averages 57 hours a week, it perhaps explains Japan's economic strength. It may also explain why the average Japanese businessman spends 10 minutes talking to his wife in every 24 hours. In Tokyo's department stores, the customer is always right. The shop assistant always in the peak of condition. Shopping is a way of life in the world's most expensive city. Discerning consumers demand value for money and impeccable service. From opening time to closing, stamina will be called for on both sides of the counter. All the department stores in Japan open at 10 in the morning, and it's customary to greet the customers at the door. We are in the planning section, and we need to see how the people react and move about in the store. 
The big advantage in working for a large company used to be lifetime employment. As long as you maintained your position, you were safe until you were 60. That system is disintegrating now, and more and more emphasis is being placed on each employee's capabilities. The younger generation can adapt to this new emphasis on individual ability. But those people older than myself seem to feel insecure about their future. The idea that a salaryman's steady progress up the career escalator might be interrupted is new. The bond between Japanese employer and worker seemed as solid as an old-fashioned marriage, founded on total commitment to the company. But with good times seemingly here to stay, the government is trying to make its citizens aware that there can be life beyond the workplace, persuading them to take at least the couple of weeks holiday a year they're entitled to. Many still resist, preferring to work. Mr. Nagawa is on ticket punching duty. Even the Japanese have not developed a machine that would do it faster. Personal contact with the passenger is preferred, however tiring. At the ticket punch, we greet the customers, good morning or good evening, and punch the tickets that they carry. I also check the expiration date and station names printed on the commuter's pass carried by the customers. Those are my main duties as ticket puncher. I don't have any aspiration in particular, but I would like to experience working in many stations other than Ginza and do the best I can in terms of promotion, although I would probably not make station master. In Ginza, we have many customers who are not very familiar with the area. So many of the customers that speak to me, they are asking me how they can get to a particular place. I tell them, giving them as precise directions as I can. Apart from the Ginza line, which began operating in 1927, the entire system has been built since 1950. Today, it's the world's fourth largest system. One key to moving such a volume of passengers is concentration of services. The square mile or so around Ginza contains 14 stations serving eight subway lines. Another is a feature unique to Tokyo, the interface of underground and overground railway systems. The subways in Tokyo are now uh, connected to the private railways <coughs> or JR uh, lines at both ends and uh, subway trains are operated even on the private railways or on JR lines under reciprocal through service. Those three different systems are integrated. Control of Tokyo subway is shared between the two subway companies and Japan Rail, the national mainline operator whose trains run the length of the country. 75% of all public transportation in the city is by rail. In a miracle of engineering, different track gauges, power supplies, trains and routes are all coordinated to keep Japan's economic juggernaut firmly on the rails. Even subway trains do not spend all their time underground. By using the main line tracks to penetrate the vast suburban sprawl, the subway system doubles its reach. Ordinarily, the passengers on this train, 
to be technical, an overhead-powered Series 6000 belonging to the Chiodo line would have to transfer when reaching the outskirts of the city. But at peak hours, it's the crew that changes trains, with due ceremony. The mainline driver who brought it over the surface track hands over to a subway driver familiar with its routes and routines, and trained to handle every underground emergency, even earthquake damage control. Tokyo is not one city, but many. It's different neighborhoods separated by some of the world's most impenetrable traffic. By far the greater part of it is new, rebuilt after the great fire bombings of World War II. Only recently have the Japanese begun to build skyscrapers. Fear of earthquakes has kept its skyline relatively low. In the times when wood and paper were all Japan had to build with, there was an earlier heyday. Tokyo was known then as Edo, at the beginning of the 18th century, it had as many citizens as any capital in Europe. And even then, the imperial palace stood at its heart. Religion is an everyday matter in Tokyo. Each neighborhood has a Shinto or Buddhist shrine. One of the better known is the Asakusa Canon Temple, where crowds gather seeking ancient cures for any ailment. Built in the 6th century and rebuilt rather more recently, it's the setting for popular ceremonies throughout the year. Some of them the festivals and rituals of childhood. But as more plate glass and neon comes to dominate the city, a glimpse of old Edo becomes harder to track down, and the cheerful street-level Tokyo of sake houses, coffee shops and public baths is fast disappearing. The old wooden houses which went up in flames so often that the fires were known as the flowers of Edo are now curiosities. Rows of tiny shops have been replaced by all-purpose supermarkets. By the late 1980s, land in Tokyo was worth 20 times that in Manhattan. 200,000 American dollars would buy just enough to build a telephone booth on. The national ingenuity for saving space has never been needed more. Rooms in a house are described by the number of bed mats that will cover the floor, a two tatami room or a three tatami one. Young hopes shrink by a bed mat every day. It's true that uh, a man's right to own his own castle is inviolable in all cultures, particularly in this one. All you can possibly afford, I mean, if you have a lot of money, is a what's called a 2DK, which is a dining kitchen, uh, someplace, you know, on the outskirts of Tokyo. And this goes, of course, in directly against the idea that you should have your own house. So what the young people have done is given up the idea that they should have their own house. They don't talk about it anymore. So the young find other things to spend their substantial savings on. If they cannot afford life's necessities, they turn to luxuries. Probably the most blatant status symbols of all in Tokyo are foreign cars. Even if they can only be driven slowly, carefully, and in a long, four-lane wide procession of similar gleaming trophies. In the time of Edo, the great shopping street of the Ginza was the site of the mint, which turned out the imperial silver coinage. Today, there are treasure houses all over Tokyo to tempt the champion spenders that Japan calls the doko shinki zoku, the aristocracy of the unmarried, for whom appearances are all important and designer fashion a social imperative. Tokyo's young even have their own part of the city, Yayogi Park. The site of the 1964 Olympics, it's the only decent place in the city to jog. 
except on a Sunday when the roads are closed and handed over to the sprayed, dyed and leather-clad yet to be employed. Tokyoites between 18 and 25 form a tribe with its own customs and costumes. They seem to have a dispensation to rattle the invisible bars of the social stockade as loudly as they like before the time comes to don a salaryman's tie or the crisp blouse of an office lady. Tempura for supper at Ginza Station. Young station assistant Nogawa and his colleagues are still on duty, fortifying themselves for the late night rush hour. Like firemen, they eat and sleep within a few steps of their task. Looking at my weekly schedule, I usually have two overnight shifts a week and two daytime shifts from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Today, I am cooking dinner and breakfast for the number of employees on overnight shift duty. Two people are assigned for each night and we go out to buy the materials and cook. Even though I am a man and not used to cooking at home, my repertoire has increased because of this cooking duty, so I don't dislike it. Above ground, the home-going torrent which begins at 11 p.m. is still building up steam. For Mr. Kotani and his colleagues, an important part of Tokyo's business day does not begin until shops and offices are closed. It's known as after work. It's this ritual of salary men socializing that extends the day to such an inordinate length. The cost of business entertaining amounts to as much annually as Japan's defense budget. Whiskey, a costly comfort, is the drink. Clients like to have their own bottle, their name inscribed on the label. Most after-working centers around the rise of karaoke singing, a unique Japanese entertainment. Musical accompaniment comes on a tape. The paying customer steps into the star role, reading the words from a prompter if he cannot recall them. There are mixed opinions about karaoke. Sometimes I go to release my own stress, sometimes to release someone else's, and also as an extension of business. When this add up, I suppose I go more frequently. I can do this because my family life is very stable. But this is not the case with everyone. I guess some people go to karaoke or go drinking to release the stress of family life. <laughs> Tokyo experiences an extraordinary late-night rush hour of reeling salarymen. Not all the late-night homegoers will be as relaxed and cheerful as Mr. Kotani. Before the night is out, station assistant Nogawa will deal tactfully with the few who could not sing their troubles away or locate their color-coded train home. Coping with stress is a popular Japanese preoccupation. The cramped journeys to and from work and long daily absences from home may be the cause of much of this widespread national complaint. Well, I think the fact there are so many people in Tokyo leads to a lot of stress for those of us who live here. Tokyo is a big city and there are a lot of people and that's one element that produces stress. Time-wise, from the minute I leave home in the morning until I get back in the evening, all that time is devoted to the company. That's just how things are.
Seoul is the fastest growing city in the world, already the fourth largest after London, New York and Tokyo. In the 1980s, its population increased by 80%. More than a quarter of South Korea's population lives here, 10 million people, all with their part to play, it seems, in a feverish drive to make their homeland a major industrial power. The land of the morning calm is also the land of the morning Russia. Over the Han River, cars pour in to turn the downtown streets into a fuming, honking inferno. But the luckiest part of the huge industrious army that occupies the city by day and withdraws at night arrives by train on one of the world's great subway systems. Seoul became the capital of Korea in 1392. Today, it's the capital only of South Korea. The wave of economic energy on which it's riding was released by the end of the war with the Communist North in 1950. Much of what has been accomplished would not have been possible without the subway as a speedy alternative to the congested roads. Even more than the will to work, a hunger for education binds the people of Seoul together. The subway delivers students to no fewer than nine universities. Some commute from so far out of town that the day seems over before it begins. Students, workers, businessmen, all with the same goal, a nation moving in unison. This stop is Chungmuro, Chungmuro. You can transfer to Orange, number three line. If ever a place cried out for a clean, fast, efficient, and safe subway, it was the new, frantically expanding Seoul. As a latecomer to mass transit, the city could shop around for ideas. There are four lines in the system. The design of two was inspired by the Tokyo Metro. The others borrowed notions from London, Paris, Montreal, and San Francisco. But as with everything they do, the South Koreans put their own unmistakable stamp on the result such as the jagged granite walls in the escalator at Chungmuru station, through which rush hour travelers, many more than use the system at other times, are piped to the surface. It's probably a problem to the subway all around the world. In the rush hour in the morning, there are 2.7 times more commuters than normal capacity. So, the passengers hardly travel in the cars, and we cope with only 44% of them at rush hour. That is 17% of the whole Seoul population. That is our most important contribution to Seoul. Once below ground, the harried traveler is soothed by music. Not only are the stations spotless and welcoming, they are extremely user-friendly. A coin in the slot and most needs are met. The gleaming metro that Seoul set out to build itself in 1974 was completed at a record rate, a mile of tunneling a month. An unusually large number of interchange stations make it easy to move around the inner city. The line that encircles the center, line two, colored green, is the longest of its kind anywhere, 33 miles. The last sections to be finished were opened in 1985. They form a scissor shape, line three, orange, and line four, blue. Traveling the 18 miles of line three on the surface would take a bus an hour and a half. The subway can do it in 44 minutes. This is far from being a wholly underground system, however. Of the total track length of 73 miles, only 15 actually lie beneath the surface, and only 17 of the 102 stations. Signals and safety systems are automated, and a radio network links drivers to the control room. Regular training on simulators presents them with situations they hope not to encounter on duty. Unlike some modern systems, this one does not turn drivers into mere additional passengers.
지하철이라는 것이 모던 테크놀로지 The subway has emerged from modern technology. It is inevitable that it is operated on the ground. So, we try to show passengers a bright side, even though they are underground using the subway. As I mentioned, each of the 102 stations has its own characteristics with a mixture of modern and old history. Whether the spectacular underground decor evokes tradition or, by all its glittering chrome, symbolizes promise, these remarkable places remind the people who pass through them each day that beyond the office for which they are headed, the factory, the hardline politics for which South Korea is notorious, and the lingering chill of the Cold War, there is a nation with a lot of lost time to make up. The new skyscrapers of Seoul are milestones of economic growth. If the present rate continues, by the year 2000, South Korea will be one of the top ten economic powers on Earth. For centuries, no house in Seoul was allowed to have more than a single story. Now it seems a building must have at least 20 floors for the corporation that put it up to be taken seriously. Korea has developed so very rapidly. We took less than a generation to arrive here, starting from the one of the poorest in the world. Economically and industrially, we do see a very clear change of uh, environment in this country now. Uh, in the past, under this collective goal, consensus of the people, that is a, a simple goal of trying to get out of poverty, it was rather easy to mobilize the national strength. Everybody wanted to achieve the same goal. Despite what this company billboard might say, putting human resources first does not always seem to be South Korea's main concern. The average worker clocks up the longest working week registered by the International Labour Organization, 54.3 hours. Industrial wages, although they have risen in recent years, are low, an average of 77 US dollars a week. And a week is usually six days with holidays a rarity. While the present economic momentum was being built up, the citizens of Seoul were constantly exhorted to put up with low wages and poor conditions for the greater good. They still do, willingly. By any standard, the 16 million strong workforce is remarkably pliable. There is something about this fierce, self-sacrificing dedication to creating prosperity at the cost of any other attainment that makes a lot of people in the capital nervous. As economic development progresses, people start to entertain different value systems. There's always some gap between expectations and fulfillment. And that gap seems to be widening up in this country faster than any other society I have experienced in other parts of the world. And this creates a sort of uh, internal tension. <laughs>
sometimes people talk about the Korean traffic. Uh, I think, uh, in a very real sense, Korean traffic is uh, an outgrowth of this same driving zeal to get ahead. Uh, and it reflects itself a little bit on the street sometimes. But uh, by golly, I'm going to try. I'm going to make it. Uh, if I work, I can rise. Having been held down for centuries, uh, now the lid is off and everybody wants to get there. And they've been trying and they've been doing it. Uh, Korean people are very individualistic. And uh, so to be head of your own business is better than to be an employee in somebody else's business. Financially speaking, there are no passengers in Seoul. Despite the shift from agriculture to manufacturing, the number of people without work has dropped. The newspaper seller on the subway, heralded by the electronic chimes in his pocket, is given his concession by a charity that looks after orphans by getting them to look after themselves. Pushing papers is a better living than working in a factory. Work starts at 4 o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock, and then from noon until 10 p.m., and evening shift from 10 to 12 o'clock. In the morning, usually the sellers are students, and in the evening, the sellers are people saving money for their basic needs. Basic needs do pretty well out of this one-man business. Selling his quota of 450 papers nets young mob $32 a day. Now that farmland around the city has been turned into suburbs, Seoul's markets are more important than ever to its residents. These incomparable all-purpose shopping centers offer all the necessities of life and the daily dose of haggling. As with other oriental cuisines, Korean cooking goes by the rule of five flavors, salt, sweet, bitter, sour, hot, mainly hot. Seoul stinks, literally. The smell of kimchi, pungent, garlic-flavored vegetable pickles that Koreans eat at nearly every meal, hangs in the air, indoors and out. But food is only the beginning. These markets are stacked with fabrics, another Korean speciality. There's a rule of five colors as well, the ones most commonly used. Red, yellow, green, white, black. But Seoul has acquired broader tastes since its textile manufacturers started catering to worldwide demand. The huge shopping district of Ite Won plays an entirely different role in the city's economy. It caters mainly to the giant American military base in the heart of Seoul, where Commander Bill Myers, United States Navy, is stationed. Like all visitors, he and his family can look over some of the world's best-known brands on sale for a fraction of the price of the real thing. Forgery of fashion labels, designs, fabrics is a way of life here. Low price? Maybe later. Well, A. Taiwan's a special area, and we enjoy, enjoy going there. It has uh, just about everything you could ever want to buy. And we enjoy just uh, interacting with the, with the merchants. There's a lot of play between the merchants and the people. You like to bargain. Um, they like to sell their, with their wares. Some of it is quite good. Some of it's not so good. But I think you'll find in, in general that in, in Korea, more so than other places I've been, if a Korean merchant has a, a second article or an article of uh, lower quality, he won't make any bones about it. He'll tell you that's what it is. You know, it's an imitation or it's, uh, you know, it's a second. Or what it is, doesn't try and pass it off as uh, first quality stuff. Itaewon is becoming an independent area of its own. And I don't, I don't believe that, you know, the American base here is, you know, that big of a factor. It's uh, 20,000 won. It's about $30. Mama's a good price. Okay. We'll come back. We live here. A lot of Bill Myers' compatriots live here. About 40,000 American servicemen, many stationed at Panmunjong. The Korean War has never been formally ended, merely halted on the armistice line here, only 35 miles north of Seoul. 
a demarcation line within this building. It's further extended to my front and rear by a 17 and a half inch slab of concrete resembling a sidewalk. Therefore, those of you stand on my left are standing in Commons, North Korea, or those of you on my right are still within the Republic. Now, if you wish to make a safe crossing into Commons, North Korea, ask that you do so in this building. At that end of the table, please not Also directly to your front. Members of the Armistice Commission have been meeting across this bleak frontier for more than 40 years. In the fierce fighting of the early 1950s, the North was supported by China and Russia. The South was backed by the United Nations, effectively by the United States. That's the way things still stand. The two halves of the country have become two nations. During the fighting, Seoul was occupied by Northern forces and all but destroyed. Today, most of its citizens do not want to see their northern neighbors get any closer than this skyscraping flagpole that marks the nearest North Korean village. The ring of mountains in which the capital nestles must have seemed formidable protection in the days of the morning calm. But just as in 1950, there would be no defense today. Seoul is still a frontline city. Fear of a new war, or to be exact, the old one breaking out afresh, gives the Seoul subway a particular significance. Once a month, there's an air raid drill. The streets empty of people. Anyone caught in the open in midtown must cool their heels for 15 minutes in the nearest underground subway station. Despite these dramatic precautions, reunification with the North remains an ideal, symbolized by one of the most riveting backdrops in the subway system, this vast expanse of stained glass. More than a million armed men face each other along the 150-mile frontier that divides the old kingdom. But here the threat is outshone by robed dancers and doves of peace. Perhaps a more compelling symbol of unification is the Korean alphabet. Quite different from either Chinese or Japanese, the phonetic version, called Hangul, was invented by a 15th century ruler, King Sejong. King Sejong's alphabet is worshipped, as another country might revere a national hero or a great victory. There's even a national holiday to celebrate it, Alphabet Day, October the 9th. The spread of education since the armistice has been phenomenal. More than half of South Korea's children between the ages of four and six belong to preschool programs. Elementary school from six until 12 is compulsory, but free. All but 5% of these pupils go on to secondary school. The children have much to learn about their country's history, even from the subway. This stop serves the National Museum. Artifacts from a collection that represents 5,000 years of a unique culture decorate the platforms. The gate of perpetual youth through which they emerge is a symbol of national rebirth after the turbulent times the 20th century inflicted on Korea. From 1910 to 1945, Korea was a Japanese protectorate. The long occupation left a conspicuous reminder. The picturesque old gate in the background once opened on Kyongbok Palace, seat of the Korean royal family. The graceless European-style building, now the museum, housed the Japanese viceroy. In a calculated gesture of superiority, it was planted between the modest single-story Korean palace and its venerable entrance.
The transformation of Seoul into a modern metropolis has wrenched its people away from their tranquil Confucian roots. The symbols of their long, if obscure, history have come to bind the generations together. The grounds of Changyong Palace are a favorite destination. On their rare days of leisure, the people of the capital crowd into this and the other parks and palaces, which are now counted among the national treasures. Out come unique traditional dresses known as hanbok. Considering the pace of modern Seoul and its unrestrained hunger for the future, it's amazing that such havens survive. But amid the high rises and grand hotels, these shrines, secret gardens, pagodas and pavilions emphasize the dilemma confronting a people whose present is suddenly so different from their past. Korean young people have been searching very hard to find out what their cultural roots are. It's quite a common question in Korea today. What is it to be Korean? Not just students, but scholars. What, you know, what defines a Korean? What is Korean-ness? How is it distinct from Chinese and Japanese and uh, other cultures? The students, in part of their search for their ethnic groups, have quite enthusiastically taken up what is commonly called farmer's music. Uh, drums, both the round drum and the hourglass drum and gongs, and uh, are learning the beats of various forms of Korean farmer's music. For the busy citizens of Seoul, a moment of privacy or introspection is likely to be as brief as the working day is long. There seems little chance of the new national spirit running off the rails. Resentful workers and students may occasionally fill the streets of Seoul in ritual protest, but when the tear gas blows away, they climb back on board the hurtling economic bandwagon. The evening rush is a little less single-minded than the morning stampede. It peaks at 7 p.m. Not everyone leaves work at the same time. Not everyone leaves work. Night turns Seoul into a different kind of city. The harsh lint of the new skyscrapers is replaced by shimmering streams of headlights and neon. But away from the tranquility below ground, it sounds the same. The drivers are just as aggressive. The blare of 100,000 horns is just one strain in the medley to which the city is marching towards the year 2000. Downtown streets are as full of people at midnight as they are at midday. What they're seeking after dark may not be quite the same as the daytime shoppers, but someone will sell it to them just the same.
Beijing's big day each year is the 1st of October. On that date, in 1949, the late chairman Mao Zedong proclaimed the founding of the new communist state from this balcony. It looks out across Tiananmen Square, the largest place of assembly on earth. Every important political manifestation in the People's Republic of China happens here. Military parades in the era of tension with the Soviet Union or the West, the rampages of the infamous Red Guards during the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s and 70s, which set out to obliterate China's past. More recently, popular riots against the government. Holidays are rare in China, and the people, in whose name all this has come about, are out to enjoy themselves. Beijing, or Peking, as foreigners once knew it, is theirs for the day. The years ahead must seem more important than the tumultuous past. Despite population control that permits only one child to a family, the future will be even more crowded. By the year 2000, there will be 1.27 billion Chinese, 70 million more than the government had hoped. For most of the holiday crowd, the day begins and ends with a ride on the subway. Perhaps not quite such a novelty as a quick trip on the city's only escalator. At the equivalent of 20 or 30 American cents, the Beijing subway is one of the city's best buys. For quite a while, the subway was one of Beijing's best-kept secrets. There are two routes, both completely underground. One has 12 stations, the other 14. They cover totally different territory. But the authorities were slow to spread the word that, for the extra 10 cents, passengers could change from one line to the other. Once everyone understood how it worked, the only interchange became the busiest point in the system. The introduction of the subway has certainly eased up the transportation situation in Beijing. When we first set up the subway, we only carried about 70 or 80,000 people. Today, we can transport 1 million several hundred thousand people. That is about 10 or 11 percent of the city's traffic, roughly 7 to 8 million per day. Especially in the western districts, the improvements are obvious. Let the passengers off first urges the banner at Beijing's main line station. No chance of anyone on the subway taking much notice of that. The first discovery awaiting the holiday crowd when they change trains in the great capital is that the subway will bring them into extremely close touch with their fellow travelers. Some Chinese say that manners simply haven't been the same since the Cultural Revolution. The old values the Red Guards were so keen to do away with included everyday courtesy. Others say that children who are brought up alone become inconsiderate. Whatever the reason, Beijing subway riders push and shove each other mercilessly and get pushed and shoved in their turn, even if they do have the right credentials. Historically, the rulers of Beijing have been better at keeping their neighbors out than at bringing them in. The Great Wall stands only 60 miles outside the city. It too is a magnet for the delegations and parties of tourists from every province in China which come for a brief glimpse of the symbols of power, both ancient and modern. The wall was begun more than 3,000 years ago as a defense against the marauding tribes of the Mongolian plain. Today, nearly a million and a half sightseers, only comparatively few foreigners among them, visit this section 
with its castellated beacon towers each year. These imposing ramparts once stretched for 3,750 miles, the only structure on Earth that can be seen from the moon. But by the time man was able to explore space, a similar wall that for centuries encircled Beijing had been sacrificed to build the subway. A few ancient gates are all that remain. Gates that the travelers of ancient times would say, as their caravans neared this city of Kubla Khan and Marco Polo, reared from the surrounding plain like dragons. Lily Hallett was a schoolgirl when the walls of old Beijing came down. Every unit, every school was building air shelters because we were told that the Soviet Union or, or which some country will attack us. So I remember uh, going to the war in the middle of the night. I mean, actually in about 12 o'clock at night and the whole class was set off. And we went to the war and we just pulled, pulled out the the brakes and took them back and built uh, to use them to build our air shelters. And when I think it back now, it just makes me feel sad and uh, funny. In wartime or under threat of attack, many a city has found its underground railway a useful air raid shelter. In Beijing, things work the other way around. This system began life as an emergency measure. The tunnel in which one line runs encircles the heart of the city, much as the old walls had done. The other line leads westward out into the countryside. In the tense 1960s, when China feared hostility from the Soviet Union, an entire...